when you meditate, whether you realize it or not, you're actually making some assumptions. That the mind can be trained. That your actions can actually make a difference. And that it's worthwhile to train the mind because the mind is what determines what actions you're going to take. You're also assuming that there's a pattern to the way action plays itself out. Certain actions are going to be skillful. In other words, they lead to good results. Other actions are not. They're going to lead to, to suffering, harm. Because if there were no pattern, things you learn today would not be applicable tomorrow. You never know. And if your actions didn't make a difference, why are you sitting here? The simple fact that you're here meditating, trying to train the mind, means that you, at least on one level, accept certain ideas as assumptions. It's like scientists. Sometimes people believe science doesn't make assumptions and it doesn't accept anything unless it's been proven. But that's not really the case. There are lots of assumptions. One, if you're going to run an experiment, you have to assume that some things cause other things and that by changing A, you may change B. There's, there are causal connections in there. In fact, that's what you're looking for. And the way you design an experiment will make the difference between whether it's a good experiment or a bad one. It's assuming that people are responsible for their actions and they can make choices. If people couldn't make choices, there'd be no sense in criticizing someone whose experiment was poorly designed or accepting the results of someone whose ex experiment was well designed. It'd all be very arbitrary. And both sides would simply say, well, I was predetermined to do it that way. Let's them off the hook. You're also assuming there's a pattern. I was reading recently some experiments that are indicating that some of the constants they use in order to calculate the size and the history of the universe seem to be different in one direction than they are in another. And that's kind of scary. Scientists, scientists like to think <clears throat> the laws of physics are the same everywhere. That's one of their basic assumptions. This one calls that into question. So there are a lot of assumptions you make simply by the fact that you act. So try to be aware of these assumptions, because we're going to be exploring them. Meditation actually puts them to the test for a particular purpose, which is to put an end to suffering. You need to train the mind. You need to, you need to experiment. And experiment means not simply following some rules. It means having a control, changing things, manipulating things, and seeing if it makes a difference. Because you can sit and watch the process for years and years and years, but if you don't do anything to the process, you're not going to really know what the patterns are. You may seem to see some patterns, but you can't really check them unless you've manipulated the causes and seen if it makes any difference in the effects. There's that old story about the Thai farmer who went into a, a town for the first time in his life. He saw a flashing neon sign. And it so happened he saw the sign when the light was on, and he walked up to it and tried to blow it out and blew on it, and sure enough, the sign went out. So it seemed that he'd blown it out. And of course, the way you check for that is to see if the sign comes back on again, and then see if it goes out on its own without you blowing it, or if it, see if it goes out every time you blow on it. You've got to check things again and again and again, and try different approaches. 
It's particularly important as you're trying to get the mind to settle down. What's going to work, what's not going to work. Sometimes it's a fluke. You're sitting here and all of a sudden everything just comes together. But you've got to figure out why, otherwise it's not going to come together. And you, know what, you wouldn't know what to do. It's not just a matter of accepting, well, sometimes the mind comes together and sometimes it doesn't. Because the coming together, as the Buddha said, is something you want to develop. You work on it. You bring it into being. That's what the word develop is in Pali, pavana. You work on it. You see what you can do in order to make those moments of concentration more frequent, longer. You've got to experiment. Otherwise you don't learn anything about the processes of the mind. You can see things arise and pass away and arise and pass away, and that's it. But the important thing about arising and passing away is you want to notice, well, what did you do to make this arise, particularly unskillful mental states? What did you do? Or when there's suffering, stress, what did you do to increase the stress? And you may notice something, then well, you've got to try it again and again. When I was staying with a John Fu and something happened in your meditation, he wasn't interested in hearing about it until it happened several times. In other words, you would learn a certain amount of mastery over it. You can bring these states of mind into being. So it's important that we're clear on our assumptions as we meditate here. Because the idea that we're simply going to watch things and objective truth is going to appear when we try to be very non-interfering. You've got to call that into question, because the truth may be appearing, but how are you going to know what's connected with what? And after, after all, it is causation that's the basic issue of right view. Right view is not inconstancy, stress, not self, or the three characteristics. Right view is the Four Noble Truths. You're looking for the stress, trying to comprehend it until you can understand the, the cause. And when you see the cause, then you abandon that. It's the causal connection that's important there. Similarly with the path. The path doesn't cause the end of suffering, but it takes you there. The image, of course, is of a path, like a road going to a mountain. The road doesn't cause the mountain. And the fact that you follow the road doesn't cause the mountain, but by following the road you get there. There's a connection. And we're assuming that there's a pattern here. Otherwise what the Buddha taught 2,600 years ago would not be relevant anymore. Things could change at any time. So we experiment. This is what's scientific about the meditation. We have the same assumptions that a scientist brings to experiment, that you have free will. You ha have the ability to choose how you're going to design your experiment. And you have to change things in order to learn about the, the patterns. Otherwise you can go through life thinking that Neon signs are going to stay lit until you blow on them, just because they happen to go out once when you blew on them. You've got to try again and again and again to see what works and what doesn't work, what's connected to what. That's where there's insight. In fact, where the skill comes in the meditation is learning how to anticipate. When something is happening, you can anticipate where it's going to go and whether it's going to be skillful or not. And if it's not, what are you going to do to deflect it? And if it is skillful, what are you going to do to make sure it really does give its results and it keeps on giving its results? And the only way you can anticipate these kinds of things is by 
going over them again and again and again. So we try to limit the number of variables here. You're sitting here with your eyes closed, focused on the breath. Now the mind's going to do a lot of different things while you're focused on the breath. So you have the choice to decide what to do. You're going to change the way you breathe. You're going to change the way you focus. Which aspect of the process you're going to focus on? The Buddha talks about four frames of reference in establishing mindfulness. And it's not that you do four different kinds of meditation exercises. You stay with the breath, which is an aspect of the body. And if you're having trouble staying with it, then you look at what the other issues might be that are involved. Is there something wrong with the feeling that you're creating through the breath? Can you change that feeling? The Buddha does recommend breathing in a way that gives rise to rapture, breathing in a way that gives rise to pleasure. Do you know how to do that? That's one aspect of staying with the breath. Or you may look at the mind state that you're bringing to the meditation. Sometimes the mind is sluggish, sometimes it's down, depressed. You need to do something to give it more energy, to gladden it, as the Buddha says. Other times it's bouncing all around like a ping pong ball. And what can you do to get it to settle down? Or it's burdened by a particular assumption, or it's burdened by a particular thought. What can you do to get it out from under that thought? That's using the mind as your frame of reference. You're still there with the breath, but you're looking at a different aspect of the problem. And then finally there are dhammas, or mental qualities. In other words, if you see that there's something that keeps pulling you away, how can you deal with it effectively so that you don't keep on getting distracted by it? What qualities do you need to let go? What qualities do you need to develop? All of these four different frames of reference are different aspects of the problem of how you stay with the breath. And so it's a matter of learning to read the situation to notice which aspect you have to focus on. This comes with practice, and it comes with experimenting, tweaking things. I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who said, compared scientists to little kids, people who still like to play even as they grow up. And most of the famous scientists were like that. They would play with ideas. They would play with possibilities. That's how they discovered things that other people hadn't discovered before. Science is not a body of knowledge. It's, a, it's an approach with assumptions. And meditation is the same. You can read all the teachings in the canon. You can read all the teachings of the Ajahns. You can repeat them. But that's not get get you awakened. What leads to awakening is taking the Buddha's approach, which was an experimental approach, based on the assumption that you can learn from changing your actions. You can change your actions to begin with. You can learn from it, too. There are patterns to be learned that way. This is what makes meditation a science. And the clearer you are about the fact that it is the approach that's going to give you the knowledge, this experimental approach, that's when the knowledge really will make a huge difference in your mind, in your life, in your entire relationship to space and time. It's that radical. So be willing to call some of your other assumptions into question, any assumptions that get in the way of the quest for the end of suffering. And give this experiment a try.